About 15 years ago, a news report caught my eye. A visually impaired Muslim woman had chosen a pony as her service animal instead of a dog. As the report concluded, the newscaster stated something to the effect that the woman uses the pony to guide her since dogs are considered unclean in Islam. Being a Maliki, I was taken aback. If Islam considers dogs to be unclean, that would mean that Malikis hold an opinion that contravenes Islam. All living things are considered ritually clean or tahir in the Maliki school, and that includes pigs. The same applies to the sweat and saliva of such animals. What this means is that if a dog or pig touch your person, clothing, or another item, that there is no obligation to wash them. An exception to this rule is when a dog licks or eats from a container, like a bowl. This is because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, ordered that when a dog licks from a vessel, one should wash it seven times, once with dirt. Most scholars extend the impurity attributed to, the, to a dog's saliva to its entire body. Consequently, one must wash any item licked or touched by a dog. Malikis, on the other hand, argue that the reason the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ordered that a vessel be washed and licked by a dog is unknown. So while it is compulsory to comply with the commandment, the rationale for doing so is indiscernible. Scholars refer to this category of injunction as غَيْرُ maqul and ma'na or ta'abudi. Hence, there is insufficient evidence to conclude that dogs are ritually unclean. Because of this nuance, many contemporary Muslims falsely claim that Malikis allow dog ownership without condition. They assume that if dogs are ritually clean, then Muslims are allowed to own pet dogs, according to Malikis. Well, Malikis also consider pigs to be ritually clean. But does that mean that Malikis permit the consumption of pork? Of course, the answer is no. Imam Malik reports in his Muwatta that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, quote, Anyone who owns a dog which does not guard his crops nor his livestock will have one qirad debited from his work each day. Another narration reads, Anyone who owns a dog which is neither trained to hunt nor a dog for livestock will have two qirads debited from his work each day. Unquote. The qirad is an undetermined measure whose exact amount scholars differ about. Regardless of its precise measurement, the hadith nevertheless clearly forbids Muslims from owning dogs unless it be from one of the three aforementioned categories. This prohibition followed an earlier permission for general ownership as the Prophet's grandsons, Hassan and Hussein, owned a puppy. But that puppy was taken away from them after the angel Gabriel informed the Prophet, peace be upon him, that he was not able to visit him one night because angels do not enter a home where there is a dog or a statue. Some Malikis, however, depart from the standard view of dog ownership. Take, for example, the pivotal scholar Ibn Abi Zayd of Qayyarumani. Upon being chided for contravening the view of Imam Malik, he responded, had Malik lived in our time, he would have taken a lion to guard him, unquote. A wall to Ibn Abi Zayd's home had collapsed, leaving his personal belongings exposed to theft. Burglaries had increased in his time, as a result, he acquired a dog to scare off potential burglars. Another important Maliki scholar, Ibn Abdul Bar, held that the hadith prohibiting dog ownership was not meant to suggest that it was sinful. In his view, the prohibition was meant to be taken as strong dislike and discouragement. He is often quoted by those claiming that Malikis allow, do allow, allow dog ownership, or at least that Malikis differ on this point. They fail, however, to mention the nuance, the, the nuance found in Ibn Abdul Bar's view. According to him, any dog a Muslim owns must have a valid use. The dogs listed in the hadith threatening a loss of good deeds for owning the wrong type of dog serve as analogs for the type of dogs not listed in those hadiths. That is to say, that even though he allows for ownership of dogs not mentioned by the Prophet, he stipulates that any dog owned by a Muslim have some specific valid use. The ownership of pet dogs and others with no valid use are merely disliked rather than sinful, according to Ibn Abdul Bar. In his commentary on the Muwatta of Imam Malik, the 17th century Egyptian scholar Muhammad ibn Abdul Baqi al Zurqani quotes Ibn Abdul Bar as saying, quote, In the hadith, there's permission given to own dogs for hunting, for livestock, and for crops. Therein is also dislike 
for owning them for separate reasons, unless it happens to fall within the meaning of hunting and the other things mentioned by analogy, such as owning them to bring certain benefits and to ward off certain harms. So the dislike of owning them applies purely to when there is no need in light of the alarm they cause to people and that the angels refuse to enter one's home. And when the prophet says that there will be a debit from his work, it means a reduction in the reward in the reward of his work. This alludes to the fact that owning them is not haram, since the haram bars ownership equally if the reward is diminished or not. So it indicates that it is disapproved of, makruh, not haram, unquote. That notwithstanding, both Ibn Abi Zayd and Ibn Abdul Bar are outliers among the Malikis. Most Malikis agree that dog ownership is haram unless the dog is owned for hunting or for guarding livestock or crops. Ibn Abi Zayd takes the rule of necessity into consideration, which makes the unlawful lawful temporarily. That rule does not alter the underlying injunction in question. But the same cannot be said ab about the opinion of Ibn Abdul Bar. His view is the most unique among Malikis. One should, however, rem remember that discouragement is still a form of prohibition inasmuch that it is a request for one to desist in action. For these reasons, as Zorqani says of the argument of Ibn Abdul Bar, quote, a response to his claim of it not being haram and the evidence he mentioned in support of it is that such does not follow by logical necessity. Rather, it is possible that the punishment is found in being denied divine approval of one's work to the extent of one or two qirats of the good he used to do had it not been for the fact that he had owned a dog. It is also possible that ownership is haram, and what is meant by the reduction is that the sin resulting from his ownership is equal to one or two qirats of his reward such that the reward of his work is reduced to the extent of the sin being a consequence of his ownership, which is one or two qirats as has preceded. The hadith also contains encouragement to multiply one's number of good deeds, a warning against doing things that will reduce them, and alert to the ways of increasing and reducing them so that it can be avoided or committed, a clarification of God's kindness to his creation in permitting for them that which brings them benefit, their prophet's communication to them of their worldly and otherworldly affairs, and the pro promotion of the weightiest of interests over harm." Unquote. In summary, Purposeful ownership is not the same as purchasing a pet. Even considering the rationale of Ibn Abi Zayd, one will notice how he draws an analogy between the crop and sheepdog and his own guard dog inasmuch that the purpose of a crop or sheepdog is to guard crops or sheep. A pet dog does not serve the same purpose. It actually serves no valid legal purpose at all. Using the three exceptions, they concluded that if one has a valid purpose for a dog, its ownership is valid and beyond the purview of the prohibition in the Hadith. The only difference is that one scholar justified ownership by the rule of necessity. The other justified it by using an unpopular linguistic tool. And since a dog guide for the blind serves as, as an important valid purpose, our visually impaired sister's concerns may have been assuaged had she been aware of the arguments of these great men.